Hola to everyone. Uh, my name is Igor. I'm glad uh, you joined me in uh, this workshop. Uh, as far as I can see, no translators around. Let's stop for, uh, for the Marseillais. Oh, sorry. So you are working from there. Ah, okay. But from, from, the, from the seat. Okay, good. And over there, good. I was expecting you over there, but no problem. Uh, I was kind of hoping oh, we'll, ha we'll have translators uh, who already received the email. Yes, okay, good. I'm glad. This will help you, believe me. And don't hate me after the workshop because of the speed. Sure. Ah, great. Um, well, we have a total of 45 minutes. We are starting late. I'm not sure whether the organizers will have anything against us using the proper time, but we'll see. If someone with arms comes in, we'll know. Um, yeah, be welcomed. Uh, I work for ADRA Serbia, but the topic um, I'm presenting, and I hope uh, I'll share uh, the talking time with you, is something of uh, like um, uh, obsession of mine for years already. And I do want to make a, a few things clear about um, myself and the topic, which uh, lies behind the, 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 the research, if I can say, if I can name it research. First of all, I'm fascinated uh, with things that change us, that shape us in any way. This is my first fascination. The second is uh, I'm fascinated by the contemporary culture, the popular culture, you name it and what seems to be the power it has over us being a Christian, a non-Christian, or whatever kind of guy or lady you are, and uh, fascinated by the fact that it seems that the, the influence it has on us sometimes overpowers the influence of the Christian lifestyle. And let me just stop here and say uh, I'm I don't really like the two general approaches to popular culture. The one is demonizing it as something bad and uh, satanic almost. Neither do I see uh, it as a very helpful to have a, the opposite side attitude of uh, endorsing everything popular culture offers you. So I'm looking for uh, people who do research and uh, who are wise enough to try this, the third road. And I hope this will be kind of uh, third road. Um, and thirdly, I want to see whether Christianity can really stand in this battle. Or are we only playing to be Christians, but basically being formed as the journey goes on by other forces. Um, basically, this is a very selfish interest of mine, because I don't really want to be a person split in two. Uh, I think the, the most miserable kind of person is person uh, really not having one wish and desire in, in life, but always split, being split uh, in two or more sides. Um, the final objective of this workshop is just to give you, to clear out the ground and to give some options and guidelines how we as a community can continue uh, understanding our culture, understanding Christian culture, uh, apropos popular culture, and us devising ways to be Christians in a sustainable way. And if possible, winning over in this battle, if, if possible. Um, three steps we'll be making today. First question will be, what do you love? The second question will be, how does, does consumer gospel works on us? And third step will be how to train our hearts for the kingdom of Christ. The first step. Um, since I became a, a guy who called himself a Christian disciple, I started being uh, haunted by a question, a dilemma. Whom do I really belong? Uh, you are all on different stages of your path, uh, life, uh, life path, if you want. Let's take the, the longest journey you will take, that's, that's your life. But uh, as for me, 
when I started falling in love with the Christian story and with Christ and everything it endorses, entails, I understood that it's not that simple. The, the transfer from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light is not that simple. And it's not one way. Uh, so, I'm still haunted by this question. Whom do I really belong to? My immediate response is, well, don't I honestly and authentically belong to Christ? I love, I love to sing songs about Christ. I like uh, reading about Christ. I like talking about Christ. I, I have goosebumps when I am part of the Christian thing. I honestly believe in the, all of the Adventist truths, or most of them, the most important ones. I'm now speaking on behalf of us. I'm honestly believing. I honestly believe. The real thing is not whether I'm honest about what I just said. The thing is that it may be true that although I really believe and think in the right way, I may not, that, that may not, uh, does not, does not really guarantee that I really belong to to the kingdom, to the right kingdom. That's the really scary option, that I really believe in it, and I really think the right way, the, all the doctrines and everything else, but that maybe that's, that doesn't guarantee I really love the kingdom. Um, there is a fascinating movie uh, recorded, uh, directed by a uh, Soviet or Russian director, Andrei Tarkovsky, in 1979. It's called Stalker. It's a very unusual movie for us Hollywood um, addicts, but uh, it's worthwhile. Um, it, it pictures some kind of post-apocalyptic scenery, and it turned out actually a few years after that, uh, Chernobyl really happened, and actually uh, it was kind of some kind of a prophetic thing. But the, the, the atmosphere, the the milieu it's, it's uh, portraying is that of a post-apocalyptic st state after something very terrible happened. And the plot follows three, three characters, only three characters. Um, the professor, the writer, and the stalker. The stalker is the guide who, one of a few stalker guides, who everybody knows in this very troubled world can lead you to a special place in the country called Zone. And to the very special place within the Zone called a Room, like a room, with large capital R. The destination is unclear, but this is clear. They're, they're appro he's approached by the two guys to be led uh, to the room within the Zone. The zone has the eerie feel of post-apocalyptic oasis, a scene where some prior destination has left ruins that are now returning to nature, cultivating a terrible beauty, says one of the critics. Why the room is so desirable? Because in the room, in the room Stalker promises them, they will achieve their heart's desire. And after some time, they come to the very unusual place. And the scene is where the professor and the writer are watching towards Stalker, who has advanced to the end of this space, and he's talking from here. And just behind the Stalker, he's talking to, to, to them like this, is this room. A mystical right, light is coming from the room. But finally, they, they reached it, but then they stopped it. This is a place where you can have what you want, what you really want. Who wants to go first? At, at that moment, in a brilliant kind of director move, you understand what's going on. When Stalker tells them, you, your most cherished desire will come true here, they stop and they start thinking, what if I don't know what I really want? 
the room will reveal your deepest, truest desire. And what if, if it turns out that you don't really want and desire what you think you desire? What if the desires they are conscious of, they've chosen as the right desires, are not their innermost longings, their deepest wish? And the thing why they are like stuck in the place and they never actually get in, is that they recall the story the stalker retold them while walking to the zone about a previous stalker called uh, Porcupine. Uh, did I hit the word? Never mind. The, the name is not that important. Porcupine? The, the, yes, the, the pig. Uh, where that stalker took his brother to the room many years ago. In the room, he, he went in and realized that in, the, in, his, in his life, his plan, his wish, and that's to be, become very rich, became a reality. But after a few months, he killed himself. himself. The real tragedy is not to be split, having several wishes or desires or loves, but not to be aware that we are split anyway. And I think that the first step towards solution is to realize we are split, not to deny it. On the outside, of course, we work hard to be Christians. On the inside, let us realize where our heart stands. My mind and my beliefs may be, the right, may be on the right side, but where is our heart? This is not necessarily the same place where my reason and my beliefs are. Another interesting, funny story told and retold by a Slovenian philosopher Slavoj Žižek and by another interesting um, Irish philosopher Pete Rollins is about a guy who was a serious um, mental disorder. He believed he is a seed, like literal seed. Um, he hired a psychotherapist and it was a few years of hard work for them for the psychotherapist to help the guy to understand that he is not seed, he is a human being. And finally, eventually, he uh, accepted the fact that he is a human being, not uh, a seed. He was convinced he is a human being. After a few days, someone is frantically knocking on the uh, psychotherapist's door. That's the guy. What's going on? Because he looked like a guy who didn't eat for seven days and didn't sleep for two weeks. He said, my neighbor, he just bought chickens. But sir, you know that you are not seed. There is no danger for you, you are a human being. Of course I know I'm a human being, but do the chicken know I'm a human being? And then the question, there are things in our being convinced in the righthood, in the rightness of the Christian path. But is the most important chicken in us convinced? Are the chickens convinced? That's the key point. Because if the heart is not convinced, if our imagination is not on fire, caught captive, got captive, how you say it in English, then having the beliefs and the, 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 the attitudes correct will not really take you far in, on the Christian path. And I was fascinated by this insight, which actually is not a new one. The art uh, uh, fantastically portrays it, some modern philosophers, psychotherapists, but the best of the Christian tradition always highlighted this truth. The lady from the 19th century, Ellen White, she was all into this subject. The biblical writers were also talking about this, but I think we somehow lost it. By the way, we lost it because we, as an Adventist church, belong to a tradition in the Christianity which basically was not birthed, but very much influenced by the modernity, by the conviction that human beings are primarily thinking beings or believing beings. 
which is not the, the biblical truth. Because the truth is that we are primarily loving beings. We are, in that sense, erotical beings, beings of the desire, of the gut, if you want. Um, let me summarize the first step. That, sorry, like, those forces which win our heart, our imagination, are the forces who are shaping who, are, who we really are. That which shapes our love, shaped us. And the real tragical thing is that the forces are happy with us having the right attitudes and right beliefs as long as our heart, our imagination is still under their influence. Because we can believe as long as we want the right things and have the right attitudes, right thinking, but if our heart is elsewhere, that other kingdom uh, is silently winning the battle, the, the war actually. And if you imagine that your heart is a compass, which is a true picture of, of our anthropology, how we are designed. And if you see that there is a one right kingdom, the, the new earth, the new heaven, we should aim forward, toward, if our heart is adjusted in a such way to lead us toward it, all our being will follow it. Because that's the way we are created, where our loves goes, or our be or all our being goes. And as one author said, actually the author I'm, uh, I'm very much indebted to, uh, James K. A. Smith, the philosopher from the States, he, he says, love is like autopilot, orienting us without our, our without out thinking about it. Once your heart is on the right place, you don't even think about it, but you are living in the right way. I guess some or most of you are uh, drivers. I remember 1994, I think, when I first uh, took my lessons, driving lessons. It was like entering a space shuttle. Too many commands, uh, too difficult to follow my legs, um, to command my legs, my arms, to uh, look on, uh, all, all, uh, in all directions. But after a few years of practice, when the skill of driving became my second nature, I would, of course, you know this, I would find myself um, uh, leaving my office with a phone in my head, going to the car, sitting down, uh, switching my uh, 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 hands-free option, driving, finishing the conversation, parking my car, and then realizing, where did I leave the office at all? I cannot remember. It becomes automated, automatized, in such a way that actually I do things because I'm skilled in them, that, that became my second nature, although I don't think about them. And that's the way we are designed, actually. It's not, uh, when, when one, one say you do it automatically, doesn't, it should not be necessarily a bad thing. This is the way we are doing the, 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 the work. Most of our moves during the day are not deliberate decisions of ours. They are, many examples can be named, but uh, my time. Um, this, this diagram, I think, is the critical one. Now the questions for the second step. How do I imagine good life? Because basically our heart strives toward the right kingdom or the wrong kingdom, and each kingdom is promising some kind of a picture of a good life, of the ideal life. So what am I imagining at this moment? And the basic thing is, the scary thing is, don't believe your first answer. Because your first answer would be politically correct answer. You're in an Adventist meeting, you're in the Adventist family, you're in, at, uh, in Anderson Church, Adventist Church. Of course, we have the social pressure to, to give the right response, the expected response. So don't believe this first answer. Basically, I'm not sure how many times you should go into yourself to find out the answer. 
Maybe the best answer is just look at your life. And that's the answer. What kind of human I really desire to become? Not wish and think I should be liking, but desire to become. What kind of human am I actually becoming? In what is shaping my imagination right now? The topic of imagination may be under discussed in this part of Christianity at least, but it's a critical one. Second step. How does consumer gospel win us? This is a case study. I truly believe there are two kingdoms, the right kingdom and many variations of the wrong kingdom. The wrong kingdom can be called the secular culture or a good part of it. It can be called consumer culture. It can be called narcissistic culture. Now I'm taking only one bite. I'll try to present how we can go behind the curtain. You, you remember the, the Wizard of Oz? To go behind it to see what's happening, what's really happening. And how this culture is trying to be below the, our radar of consciousness. Trying to shape our imagination. The thing is that our imagination is always shaped not by doctrines and pamphlets of information but by these things, metaphors, stories, poetry or art, if you want, images. Because this is the, the wisdom of the strategists, marketing strategists, if you want. They know that our anthropology, sometimes better than uh, our part of Christianity, which is very rational sometimes. And this is that if they win us, if they win our imaginations, if they fire them, if they catch them, they will have us as consumers. This is what they are interested for. And they will catch our imaginations if they bombard us with appealing images, metaphors, stories about the good life, which are rarely expressed in words but reach us, they reach our gut, they get us, and they slowly, be below our radar of consciousness, are turning us into a, into a death vision of a human. First, they train our wishes and desires, and then they are slowly turning us into that kind of human. I'll, in the, in, uh, the example will be, I think, clearer. And, we have to repeatedly be involved in these practices where we are bombarded. This is very critical. This is the basic anthropology of how we are changed. Our heart and loves are won by the metaphors, the peeling metaphors, the images, stories. We are repeatedly emerged into, willingly or unwillingly. We'll see at the end that actually the Christian formation if we want to form our hearts to love the right kingdom and for us to be easy to go to, to journey toward the right kingdom, the same strategy will have to be applied. And be free to, um, to have a parallel road of your, you're actually having it anyway, you're thinking who knows of what now, but be free to, to think of, to analyze how, whether our church life, it's too rational sometimes, and no wonder we are not really with our both feet in it, if I can say it. This is my attempt or the attempt of James K. Smith I, I quoted. I'm using heavily uh, his, his uh, books on this, on cultural uh, liturgies. He calls this his series cultural liturgies. I wholeheartedly recommend his books. Um, these are my attempts, or his, our attempts, to see behind the strategy of the consumer gospel. Of the consumer gospel. Of the shopping mall. Shopping mall is actually a cathedral. When you enter it, notice how it was designed very similar to 
cathedrals, when the architecture of these old uh, traditional churches, where the architect architecture was with a, in a, uh, uh, with a plan, with a plan, with a clear plan, you are surrounded by the atmosphere almost that you forget that there is a, a, a world outside of the, of, the, of the dome. When you approach, all these shops can be really named chapels, where the mannequins, the models, are the saints, creating a new desire to become one of them perfectly body-shaped, young, healthy. There are the mannequins, but also the, you have the billboards, the best actors, the best actresses, the best sportsmen, sport women. They fire the, they fire the, the, the image in yourself that you can become one. You enter, there is a sacrifice to be made at the altar, you pay. You buy, some, you buy something of it, and at least for one step, you came closer to the look, to the image of the perfect human person. You have been, uh, you can be led by pictures, images, metaphors to believe, to want, not to believe, to want. Um, the thing is that actually, this gospel, the consumer gospel, starts with almost the same premise as the, the real gospel. You are broken. And this, this is, um, again, no one really gives you pamphlets saying you are ugly, go to the shop. <laughs> or you're outdated. They bombard you. So interestingly, no, no uh, words are communicated. Only pictures. And few words maybe on the, but you see the, the dominance of the visual, of the, they communicate with your senses. I used to believe this is wrong, but actually this is a good anthropology. This is not wrong. Remember the Old Testament temple, how much it, the story of, the, of, the, of, of God's doing was, was in the sounds, in the smells, in the sights, and everything else. So the, 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 the unspoken message is, you're broken, you know this, and we know this. Um, I mix my... Here we are. Um, so the, the, the shopping mall is not a neutral place. It's not neutral. It's it's a religious place. And the pictures they are selling are the pictures which have power. You are broken. We offer you to become something you want. And interestingly, they always respect the authentic needs of a human person to be happy, to be healthy. Um, but they always sell some inferior values, like beauty and other values. This is happening whether you are aware of it or, or not. And be aware of this, of your unawareness. I'm broken, therefore I shop. There is a redemption offered for your brokenness. In the brackets, you will look like these people. Happy, healthy, fulfilled. You go in, there is a sacrifice, so you feel like it's a real religion, it's not cheap. You sacrifice and it hurts. You get a portion of that good life and you go out. Of course, the, the redemption is, uh, it has a very short time, uh, short time life. And the industry, of course, has a ready uh, message. Uh, no, don't worry, there is a new cloth, a new gadget, a new car, a new something which will, and ba basically this is the best thing. They used to uh, create best cars in uh, 20, 30 years ago. Now they, with a the purpose, they make, make them uh, uh, to break down uh, quicker. Uh, 
So that you can... The second is I shop with others. We go to shopping uh, with others usually, and sometimes in order to be with others. And it can even sound that this, this is like uh, boosting our social life. That this is actually about us, not about the act of shopping. The thing is, and you can really think about it, that it's actually competition when you go with others. And there is a triangle, the ideal, myself, and my friends. And I'm always checking myself against the ideal, and I'm checking whether they are closer to the ideal than I am, and of course, what this makes to how I look um, compared to them. So it looks like a social, healthy social thing, but actually competition and objectification is at place, is, is what's going on. Objectification meaning I'm viewing other people as, as bodies, as objects. Competition. Think about it. Endless silent competition, basically. The third thing you can, you can, you can say about the, the consumer gospel um, is that there is a liturgy. You know that word, maybe it's not that, that familiar in the Adventist circles, but liturgy means something we are doing in the, in the sacred place. And this liturgy uh, uh, is part of our Christian formation or religious formation. This is a liturgy as well. So the liturgies of the market are an invitation to solve the problem we have. Redeem yourself in and through the goods and services and market pro and which the market provides. So there is a way to redeem the problem, to redeem yourself. But the message is that what is wrong with you is not that you are morally corrupt or that you are selfish, but that you have misshaped body, you have pimply face, you have outdated wardrobe, a rusting old car, and so on. And the point is to be in the cycle so that some questions are never asked. For example, the dirty little secret this kingdom wants us not to pay attention to is that these commodities are affordable because there is a silent black word of cheap slave workforce in the world. That's the dirty little secret. Otherwise, it would be like skyrocketing in the prices. So they want us not to see this, but to imagine the, the more like, almost like a magic kingdom where all these commodities drop by the, are dropped by the aliens. They, have, they don't have their origin or uh, uh, dark part of the story. And that's the point. I shop and shop and shop. And that has to do with the fourth. Don't ask, don't tell. The rituals of the, the mall want us to know that don't, you don't have to think about other things. Just focus on this. Not to go behind to the black story. Who produced it? Under, is it a child labor or... As all the story you know, I already told. And the second thing, which is not uh, placed in front of our eyes, is this is ev everything is disposable. All these commodities, they are pushed to the side, you throw it in the bin, and they go somewhere. They, we want to believe that uh, it doesn't harm anyone, but actually it does harm, as we heard. There's the other part of this, don't ask, don't tell. So finally, how to fight this? Is there a way? Uh, a long story, but I would like just to, just to have to, I would like just to have a, a, a one step into, the, into that direction to talk about the Christian practices, which have been with us, which are a rich resource to draw from. Summarize: We have to train our desires. It's very important to have a right thinking and right beliefs. I'm assuming this, and because of the time issue, I'm not talking about the balance. It's very important not to go to the other direction, to neglect the information, no. 
the, actually, uh, one of the French philosophers, I forgot uh, who was it, said that the, the supremacy of, of reason is that it knows that it's inferior to heart, to the heart. Meaning, reason is given for us to analyze, to them unmask, unmask things which want to bring us to their side but are part of the Black Kingdom, and then to decide to commit yourself to trainings, like a good sportsman. Every morning, every day, I'll, I'll, I'll have a plan to immerse myself in training of my loves, of my heart. That's the part of the reason. And then the reason leaves the story of change to the Spirit of God, of course, who uses the images, the metaphors, the practices, Christian practices, which desire, which form our desires for the Christ kingdom. That's the point. Only two. I'm sorry that the, probably the most important thing uh, is left with the two uh, few minutes. But uh, anyway, this is uh, just an invitation to, to think about this and to make this a, 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 a topic for the talk. God's rhythms. Time is very important. But not only that uh, save your time in that sense, um, um, plan your time uh, and so forth. What, how we are, how our time is organized on the larger scale, when you, when you draw back from your life, affects your imagination and your image of what your life is about and where I'm heading. Remember how the ancient Israelites received this kind of liturgical year. They had all year organized around five festivals, five uh, corporate events where what was celebrated? God's presence and God's activity, not only back then, but now, right here. And it was corporate, it was like a massive, like, a, like you remember the concert or the Congress. It's important to be uh, with many people. So the whole year was organized around the fact that we are not the center of the history, but God and God's acting, God's presence and acting. Whatever I'm doing in my kitchen, I'm learned in this way, has to do with the God story. Whatever I'm doing in the field, in the farm, has to do. Whatever I'm doing in the temple has to do. Whatever I'm doing at the market has to do with the God story. So the whole, because we live in time, we are immersed in this fact through imagination. That's, that's the, basic, the basic approach. Look at the secular liturgical year. Uh, notice that the, the consumer gospel has its own liturgical year. Christmas sale, Easter sale, if I can include summer holiday, and then sales and pre-sales and post-sales. So everything is around what? What is teaching this you on, on, the, on, the, on the gut level? You are a consumer. So everything is planned. I don't want to buy now. I'll buy in the autumn when the summer clothes are on sale or our outlet or something. I plan all my year so that to have a summer holiday. So it's, thank God for summer holidays. But I'm talking about that everything is, God is nowhere around actually. It's you. You as a good citizen, you as a, as a productive citizen, you as someone who should rest. Why? Because someone has to work 110% after you get back to work. And the whole system is basically learning your gut to not to count on God, on God's reality. And that's the point. So you see the, the counter, the, 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 the battle between these. Sabbath is a great thing. Because this is the Adventist way of organizing our life in cycles of seven, of seven. You cannot escape it, and that, that's a good thing. You, cannot, you can pretend, well, you cannot go to church on Sabbath, but you cannot uh, evade the Sabbath. You're in it. 
it's perfectly. Time is like a temple in time. Uh, Sabbath is temple in time, um, as uh, Abraham Heschel, the Jewish philosopher, wrote. So, God's rhythms, or the rhythm of our life, when we celebrate the Sabbath, is teaching us on the gut level that if we stop with our work, with our studies, the universe will continue. It will not collapse. God is competent. I'm trusting my life and the whole reality, if I'm really that preposterous, uh, to God. Everything will run perfectly. And we are learning this. Maybe I'm not aware of this, but this is the precious gift of Sabbath. For example, I'm learning that God is trustworthy, that I'm not the center. And you can even see, even if, even if I'm in a bad phase of my Christian life, if I keep practicing the Sabbath, it's, it keeps me, keeps me safe not to go too far. And this goes for other Christian practices like fasting, praying, reading the Bible. And the second one I want to finish with, serving for free. If you, have the, if you develop the habit, develop the habit of serving other needy people, uh, it will not be, please remember this, uh, our Christian life is not only an expression of our faith, it is forming our faith. We sometimes forget our worship is not only ex expressing of joy, we are formed in the, in the event of worship. The action from, from above to, toward us is, is more intensive than our action toward Him during the worship. Just uh, uh, a tip for thinking. To, to, to start thinking about the Christian practices this way. If you serve others, this is a good thing, of course. You feel uh, useful and you, you feel that you're, you sweated and you shed some blood for the others. But the, the wise guys in the Christian tradition uh, were, were repeating that try to serve those who cannot return you, with whom you cannot have any kind of transaction. Transaction can be a counter favor, or that that person can say a good word to someone else, not only a monetary transaction. Uh, because this way, this is the best way to fight pride and to insert humility. And in this way, without even uh, reading books about it, but doing it on a regular basis, you are being formed on the most important, beautiful, down, deep level. That the life is not about me, and life is not about me getting something from each situation. That salvation is not about eternal life. Situation is about the privilege to live right now as a useful part of the ecosystem and to find a joy, a real joy. And that joy is formed by this kind of life. Not by only by reading books, but by people learn more about uh, theology sometimes. As one guy said, by being a regular um, uh, um, guy who regularly visits um, workout, uh, how you say, bodybuilding, not bodybuilding, Gym? gyms, yeah, sorry. Over there with your body, you can learn more about the life and about being a persistent than uh, sometimes by reading books. That's all I think. You belong to the kingdom which you love. Your love is formed by the stories, metaphors, images you feed your body with, and the practices you repeat where you are bombarded with this. Worship and other Christian practices are your tools. Use them. I hope this is only a start of conversation. Well, now or at later stage. Thank you.